Okay. All right. Thank you for having me here at Dartmouth uh, College. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. You guys here as uh, students in the university. Uh, I guess the question is, how you guys are? You guys worried about man-made climate change? Anyone here believes it's like a crisis uh, that needs one, two, three, four? Okay. All right. Yeah. Looks like we have a majority. And what do you? If you don't mind, like, where do you get most of your news on that? Is that just social media, the UN media, uh, regular newspapers, outlets? What's your <laughs> professors? Okay. What's the biggest fear when you think of climate change? Is it sea level? Is it like extreme weather? Or any polar bears? Anything in particular? Which will that was what you say? Droughts. Okay. All right. Well, this is good. I'm going to try. You know, ten years ago when I gave these talks, I've been doing this. Uh, I'm not a scientist, I like to say, but I sometimes play one on TV. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I come at this as an investigative journalist. So when I um, started, I did an Amazon rainforest documentary back in the 90s. And I was actually considered myself a Republican conservative, except when it came to environmental issues. So I was always uh, like mad at the Reagan administration and his interior secretary for their logging practices and putting in roads. But when I realized that the Amazon, and if you remember back in the 80s and 90s, that was the big scare of the, of the time uh, because you had had Sting's Rainforest concert, the musician, you had National Geographic, Disney, Hollywood movies, all about the clearing of the rainforest and how they, where we're losing these forever. I went down to Brazil, I got to go down twice, interviewed environmentalists down there, did a documentary called Amazon Rainforest, Clear Cutting the Myths. Uh, and it was amazing because it was the most intact forest for every acre cut it would regenerate, and you know, even in later years, when the of rainforest is faded, the New York Times finally did an article saying for every acre of rainforest cut, 50 get regenerated because people in general are moving from the jungles into the uh, suburbs and cities, and they're leaving behind. So the slash and burn agriculture they're worried about is fading, or less uh, pressure. And also they have something called this sustainable forestry, the new forestry technique. So when climate change, when I started looking at that, Again, as an investigative journalist in the late 90s, I was already a little bit skeptical because I'd seen how environmental scares are overhyped. So what I started doing, I started going to all these UN conferences. I worked for a thing called Cybercast News Service, and then I worked for the US Senate Environment and Public Works Committee um, on the Republican side and got to go to all these UN summits and started communicating with scientists. I ended up authoring a 400 dissenting scientist report, which then went to over 700. This is back during um, the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of President Barack Obama's administration. So I got to talk to some of the world's greatest scientists. We assembled this report. It ended up being over a thousand dissenting scientists, many of them United Nations scientists. And it was an amazing thing to see because it was, was a narrative and there was such a diversity of views and such a different story than the media tells. So what I'm gonna to try to do today is give you a little outline of the science and then mix in the politics. And I'm also gonna talk about the COVID climate connection uh, as it relates to that. So let's go, this is the, the talk is called the Green New Deal, not new, not green, not a deal. And the interesting thing about the Green New Deal, that's my book, which is out, uh, came out last, er, March of last year. Uh, Mark Stein did the forward on it, but essentially I go through the entire climate history movement. I have a whole chapter just devoted to the science. And I also go through how like the 1970s, where people worried about extreme weather. They literally thought fossil fuels caused global cooling before fossil fuels caused global warming. In the 1970s, they thought our aerosols from fossil fuels were going to block out the sun, cause global dimming. And interestingly enough, they were worried about extreme weather, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes. They were worried about national security threat of a cooling climate. A cooler climate was said to be climate un un unstable climate. And of course, they reversed that in years later. But, you know, Earth's geologic history, the Earth is in a CO2 famine, geologically speaking. In other words, 90% of the Earth's history, geologically, has had higher CO2 levels and much higher temperatures. We're in the 10% coldest part of Earth's history. We've also had ice ages with many times higher CO2. You all remember this from Al Gore's film. He showed the CO2 and it made it look really scary. That went back uh, a few hundred thousand years based on ice core data. But what he didn't show you was a longer term picture of that. If you go back millions of years, this was at Al Gore's high point. And if you go back there, you can see that CO2 levels have been much higher. And again, we've had ice ages with CO2 levels higher. So the correlation between temperature and CO2 
uh, is not very good in the Earth's history. This is a current chart from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, still up on the website, and it shows Earth's history is much hotter. We are down in that blue cooler part today, and this is in the last 500 million years. So this gives you a sense that it's just not the simple picture that they're doing. Now they're talking about a much shorter time frame with ice core data, but we're showing geologists look at the history of the Earth, they see it much different. This chart was in the first United Nations climate panel uh, report before it, you know, they essentially started drumming out anything that could be used to tamp down uh, climate change fears. But you can see the medieval warm period much warmer than today. So when people say, you know, here are Republicans, a lot of senators, I say climate change is real and humans contribute. That's fine. That's a roughly a, a true statement because climate's always changed. And yes, humans contribute. In the 1970s, they were worried we were cooling and now they're worried CO2 is adding some warming. But if you go back to the Roman, Roman warming period, about 0 AD, peer-reviewed studies, and I cited in, the, in my first book, Politically Incorrect, goes more into this. There's a whole chapter on the previous temperature changes. The, we probably cooled since the Roman warming period of zero. We're probably about the same or as warm as the medieval warm period, or slightly cooled since then. And we've definitely warmed since 1850 in the end of the Little Ice Age. So when thermometer data just coincided to come on, we've definitely warmed. And you'll see a whole movement afoot with TV weatherman now, and they use 1970. It's an environmental group behind the scenes getting certain TV weathermen to promote. Since 1970, our city has warmed X amount. Well, they picked 1970 because it's one of the coolest uh, temperatures of the 20th century. That was back during the Ice Age scare, so they can enhance the warming. If they go back to the 1930s, EPA charts show that in the continental US, the 1930s were much, much more heat waves than anything we've come through since the 1930s. It was the hottest decade in terms of U.S. city heat waves, and that, of course, is the best temperature data from around the globe, but it's just interesting how they try to show you stuff that does 1970, 1960, because you can always show an enhanced warming trend from there. But if you go back, you can also show the Arctic Greenland had similar warm periods back in the 1930s and 40s. This is Greenpeace co-founder Patrick Moore. This is the temperature going back to 1880, and he's showing you if you put it on a proper scale, uh, and not tenths of a degree, not hundredths of a degree. That's basically the temperature change of the last 120 years. But they, they hype it. If you hear the phrase, it's the hottest year on record, the hottest decade. What they don't tell you, and I've done multiple reports on this, and I've relied on former NASA scientists, that, that are award-winning NASA scientists, they're within hundredths of a degree difference from the previous year. And they can adjust the temperature data to tenths of a degree. They claim a hottest year based on a, a, within the margin of error of the temperature data set. This is my favorite sort of explanation that climate change is governed by hundreds of factors and variables. The very idea we can manage climate change predictably by understanding and manipulating at the margins one politically selected factor, CO2, is as misguided as it gets. It's scientific nonsense. We featured uh, uh, Philip Stotts in the UK in our first film, Climate Hustle. And the gist of this is there are the hundreds of factors are everything from tilt to earth axis, water vapor, methane, uh, cloud cycles, volcanoes, um, and ocean cycles is a huge one. But the idea that CO2 is somehow the, the, the control finger of the climate, and if we can just do that, we can control the climate. They don't even want to talk about it. So what you guys have probably heard and your professors probably couldn't know a class without mentioning is the 97% consensus. And in my book, I go into this and also our movie, which we did is called Climate Hustle and Climate Hustle 2. We found that the claims of the 97%, one of the studies was based on 77 anonymous scientists. This was put together by uh, different climate activists. It started out with 10,000 scientists survey, whittled it down to 77, asked, is the earth warming? As humans contribute, which most skeptical scientists would agree with, and they came up with 97%. Another one was done, another 97% study was done by an Australian researcher named John Cook. Well, a UN lead scientist, Richard Toll, looked into it and he said the 97% is essentially pulled from thin air. It's not based on any credible research whatsoever. In other words, if you're funding a series of studies claiming a climate catastrophe, and you go through all these studies and you say, well, all these, you know, all these scientists agree that they're doing it. They didn't look at the whole picture of it and they didn't actually have the data to back that up. And, and the reality is Nobel Prize winning scientists and former United Nations scientists have turned against the UN. One of the things they like to do is these, the tipping points. We've heard of AOC and the, we have 12 years of the climate thing. You know, but 
climate, we're all going to die. We have 10 years to stop the catastrophe. They're actually doing a countdown. I think she recently said nine years because it's been three years since she originally said that. This has been the United Nations in 1989. They warned of the climate tipping point in the 1970s. They warned of it in 1972. And I have in the book, I go back to 1864. It's the earliest I could find an academic uh, named George Parkins Marshall warning of a uh, climatic excess unless men change their ways. So in our first film, we interviewed a bunch of, uh, a bunch of experts who explained that it's deep within human psychology to believe that we have a crisis, that we have this existential threat, that we need to find a way to solve it. It's sort of a, it's sort of, we're wired for fear in a way. And climate change has traditionally played into that fear of people that we, that there's some kind of doom and we have to do our essentially certain acts in order to prevent it. In 2021, the United Nations, Nations still at it came out with a big report. The lead author of this report actually said, I think people uh, are more and more starting to get scared. He's a senior scientist, a climate risk friend, lead author of the United Nations report. I think this UN report will help change people's attitudes and hopefully affect the way they vote. So when your professors here at Dartmouth say, well, the United Nations estimate does it, the United Nations was set up climate panel in 1988 to show that climate change is uh, to, to only study how CO2 impacts climate. If they fail to find CO2 as the control knob of climate, they fail to not only have their big scientific funding reports, but they fail to actually be in charge of the solution, i.e. the UN Paris Agreement and these annual conferences of exotic locations. So the United Nations is a self-serving lobbying organization, their climate panel, Yes, it did win a Nobel Prize, but it won a Nobel Peace Prize for political activism, not science. People forget that. Climate futility, you'll hear people like Chuck Schumer, if we'd only done more on climate, these hurricanes wouldn't be so bad, the Senator from New York. Well, this is going back the first Earth Treaty, 1992, which set up this whole UN process. Those are the names of every, oh, not every, I think it's every single one, actually. Every single United Nations Climate Summit, which are annual, sometimes they skip a year, but you see, Montreal, what's that chart of carbon dioxide? It continues to go up. If you see the one that says Paris, that was hailed as the one that saved the planet. John Kerry brought his granddaughter down to sign it. They said it was going to be future generations would remember. The French president said that, President Obama. We had basically had saved the earth, but nothing happened to the climate because CO2 continues to go up. Even lockdown did not affect CO2 emissions. Sure. They tell us that CO2 has uh, long time delays in it. So why would we expect to see those? On this, especially if those early ones didn't have big effects like the real ones. And they correct me if I'm wrong. Well, that was starting off with uh, fluorocarbons and all of that stuff. Yeah, that well, the real one that, that was the that was back with the air conditioning stuff. The lockdowns actually did reduce human emissions of CO2 briefly. I think it was like 7% in uh, 2020. Well, I mean, yes, your, your point is taken that that's a long term thing, however. The point is that CO2 is continuing to go up. John Kerry, after the Paris Agreement, actually said if the United States zeroed out our emissions to nothing, it would not affect uh, CO2 levels. Actually, it wouldn't affect this is a different chart, but it wouldn't affect the CO2 emissions of, of every country, the global emissions every year, because the developing world is so overwhelming to the, to the, to the emissions. Uh, but this is more of a chart just to show you that no matter what humans can do, because ultimately, if you actually want to affect the climate, these things would have to, at some point, do something about it. And the point is, not only are they not doing anything because emissions continue to rise, uh, even beyond that this is the natural cycle, it's not going to do anything. So it's more of a rhetorical point, and I put that in there to show the fun. But they're declaring that they're actually uh, you know, solving the climate crisis, especially after Copenhagen and then uh, Paris. Uh, but you're right, it does take a long time. But even if we zero out, our emissions from countries are still going to continue to go up. Um, this is a study published in January 2nd, 2020 this year. On the basis of observational data, the climate crisis is not evident, published in the European Physics Journal. And this is interesting because they look at the extreme weather indicators, and this is one of the biggest things now that people are talking about. Uh, just real quick, this is just overall burning of land, now, obviously back in the 20s and 30s much worse back then. We have much better forestry management now, but even wildfires are not a great metric of climate because you're dealing with land use issues, government, zoning laws, water resources, 
very heavily tied into politics and development of an area, but still there's no wildfire crisis. And even globally, there's been studies and I cite those in the book about the, the history of wildfires. Drought conditions, this is in the contiguous 48 states, but also global drought is showing either no trend or declining trend in peer reviewed literature. Now, if you look at uh, projections in scary computer models, yes, it could show you scary. Or if you start at say, look at that chart. If you start in the year 2000 and you go to 20, almost 2018, you can show a big increase in drought. But if you look back further, you can just, it's a, it, it's a, it shows you that drought is cyclical, just like climate. California, I believe this is the California. This was actually in the mainstream media actually picked up on this, the drought in California. Previous centuries in California were much, much worse than the drought. So the idea that it could somehow be human caused does not add up uh, in any of this, in any of these measures. And this is a, this is a great chart because it shows you where California is and how much worse they've had in the past. Again, it's cyclical. No carbon tax or solar energy mandate or Green New Deal is going to change that chart. U.S. flood damage and not only flood damage, but you know, global floods, according to journal hydrology, uh, hydrology journals, are showing either no trend, declining trend, but this is just also showing that it's not a uh, kind of catastrophe. You can see where when CO2 was lower in the atmosphere, we had much worse flood uh, damage. Global hurricane frequency, this was updated at the end of last summer. You can see there, it's pretty much no trend. And this is uh, the, the, the frequency, also the intensity. This is a meteorologist, Ryan Mao, who monitors this. He worked for NOAA. Um, this shows you that hurricanes, you can't, and actually hurricanes, uh, and many people are quite, you know, depending on what metric you use, the big ones are either, on, probably on declining trends, 1940s are the most active for uh, hurricanes. If you're worried about tornadoes, yes, there's more tornadoes because they have better detection. If you go back to 19, 50s, when they started the, the, the uh, uh, measuring of these with the modern methods, EF5, 4, and 3, the bigger tornadoes, you can see how they're actually on a decline over that time scale. But overall, tornadoes are much higher because they have better detection, Doppler radars, satellites, and they, they're, they're finding tornadoes. You're counting tornadoes now, they never would have. But if you look at the big tornadoes, the kind of do damage, it's not happening like they're, they're claiming. Interestingly enough, the, the number of mentions of extreme weather in the media has gone up dramatically. And back in 2006, when I was in Bali, I was with John McCain's uh, climate guy. They actually were saying, we're going to start switching the climate debate and start talking about tying weather events to climate. And I said, that'll never work because that makes no sense. There's always been extreme weather events. But it worked because if you look right after 2005, that was Bali 2007, the media started picking up climate activists. The whole narrative shifted. They tried to make it so they weaponized weather. Flood, hurricane, tornado, that's the finger of climate change. You've experienced climate change. I mentioned earlier, and I, again, I go into uh, my first book and also our movie, we go into much deeper into my website. I have whole reports. Arctic, Antarctica, Greenland, all you know, were, went through an alarming period, the late 30s, early 40s, about the melting and you know, that exaggeration. Glaciers like those face the possibility of catastrophic collapse. Well, we've always faced that. And it goes back to the New York, the Associated Press has done the same story on Antarctica, recycled for almost 100 years. The media just, you know, if Antarctica, this happens, this would happen, and DC would be underwater. It's the same thing over and over. This is a premier scientist, climate scientist from the Netherlands Meteorological uh, Society in. Uh, in, in Europe. The doomsday picture Al Gore of sea level is entirely without merit. And this is the key line. I protest vigorously the idea that climate reacts like a home heating system to a change setting of the thermostat. Just turn the dial and the desired temperature will soon be reached. That's literally how the United Nations likes to talk about it. You hear about the two degree, 1.5 degree temperature goal. But if you look at the actual documents behind that, that's a political goal. They, they just needed something they could coalesce behind, but people think it's like literal and there's like hard science. It's just based on climate models, which don't account for half the variability in nature and which even UN scientists say are storylines and merely emission scenarios that you can't really rely on. It's to motivate people politically. It's not like, oh my gosh, the earth is gonna reach this if we don't do it. Polar bears, Al, they are disappearing, but they're disappearing from Al Gore's books and movies. Al Gore in 2007 made the polar bear his poster child. He didn't even mention it in his sequel in 2017 or in his book. Why? Because polar bears are at a historic population highs. They stopped a hunting ban back, I guess, in mid-1960s. Polar bear numbers have increased. 
dramatically. Polar bears uh, are actually you know, doing incredibly well to the point where climate activists don't even like to talk about them. But here's where they can actually get, a, get some attention. They do a misdirection. They'll say, well, it's worse than we thought for polar bears. You're like, how? They're actually doing better. There's more of them than they counted. The indigenous people of the Arctic say there's no threat. And they'll say, well, our predictions now of 50 to 100 years are much worse than they were just five years ago. So when current reality fails to alarm, they make scarier and scarier predictions of the future. This is the UN. Uh, this is an academic in Europe. The UN is purely a political body posing as a scientific institution. It's literally the chairman, the former chairman was a guy named Rajendra Bachari. He said, global warming is my religion. And they actually said, we are at the beck and call of governments to produce a product. And the product, product they produce, this is the UN Climate Science Panel, is a product showing that climate change is a problem caused by man. And he actually said, if, we, if, they, if, we, if they want a different product, we would do a different product. It's a political body posing as a scientific, as the most perfect explanation. If anyone who cites the United Nations, this is another top UN official who back, this is about 12 years ago, the UN will redistribute the fact of the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. There's almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. This is the key thing. So when your professors here at Dartmouth cite the UN as this Nobel Prize winning, Peace Prize, political prize winning organization, this is when they, they have their moment of sort of their, they say the quiet part out loud where they tell you, and this is similar to what's happened with the Green New Deal. They said the quiet part out loud. This is not about science. And you're finding that out in real time. I don't know how much you guys have followed the COVID mandates restrictions. This is what's happening real time with COVID mandates is it was never really about the science when it comes to that, uh, because now they're trying to say the science has changed. Well, what's changed on the COVID mandates is the governor of New Jersey, after you almost lost it, did focus polling. And they found that the, among the base of his blue state Democrats, they wanted everything to get back to normal. This has now caused a, a huge influx of Democrats everywhere saying the science has changed and we're now lifting vax mandates and mask mandates. And the science hasn't changed. It was never supporting all those kind of restrictions anyway. But it's the same thing here. It's, it's these are captured agencies. The same way like the CDC almost comes off as a lobbying organization when it comes to promoting a public health message and they won't allow any dissent. The UN has tried the exact same thing. Everything I learned uh, from the climate debate is actually applied to the COVID debate in real time, except it was compressed in two years. And I'm not talking the virus was real, the virus was you know, harmful. Not, uh, I'm not arguing about that. I'm arguing about the response to the virus. They were very excited to have a crisis. They had a climate crisis for decades, couldn't get anywhere. And then they come up with, the, the, they come up with COVID mandates and lockdowns. And this is what the, the progressives have coalesced on. As part of that, this UN climate process has been going on since 1988. The Omicron variant spreads countries model a radical pandemic treaty. So this is where the, the uh, COVID-19 public health bureaucracy is looking at how climate has been successful all these years and decades promoting this with conferences and this. They want to start a similar thing. And you can bet that this kind of a pandemic treaty is not going to allow dissenting voices of any kind. And if you know anything about the COVID lockdowns, that was the biggest problem. Not only did they suppress other public health scientists and doctors, but they suppressed any other field. So if an epidemiologist says, we must do this to stop the virus. Well, wait a minute. Are you an expert in mental health, drug addiction, economic loss, uh, health care damages that come from people not delayed medical care, delayed cancer? Are you an expert on the, the uh, impact on kids? This is what ends up happening. The world is never as simple as they make it sound. Epidemiologists, we must listen to them. That's all governors, mayors, town, everyone listened to them only and didn't look at the big picture. Same thing when it came to climate. They, can't, they claim we have, we have to shut down this industry. We'll get to exactly what they're claiming in a second. But I want to go through some of the settled science. You'll hear that phrase over and over. The science is settled. And you'll also hear from your professors, the climate models have been very accurate. They've been predicted on this. Let's take a look. Predict both outcomes and you're always right. Climate change causes more brain but less water. Climate change means less snow. Climate change means more snow. Climate change causes Antarctica to lose land ice. Climate change causes Antarctica to, to gain the land ice. No matter what happens, they claim it's climate, they predict the opposite. Climate change causes duller autumn leaves. Climate change causes more uh, colorful autumn leaves. You name it, they got it. So guess what happens? No matter what happens, your professor at Dartmouth can say, wait, the climate scientists actually predicted in all these things, but they, what he might leave out is that they predicted the opposite of everything, just in case they weren't quite right. Climate change makes for saltier seas. Climate change makes for less salty seas. 
Climate change increases spread of malaria. Climate change decreases spread of malaria. Uh, dengue fever outbreaks increase with climate change. Dengue fever outbreaks decrease with climate change. You make your pick. U.S. will see 50% more lightning strikes thanks to global warming. Lightning strikes could drop 15% as climate change causes global temperatures to soar. Take your pick. Climate change makes San Francisco foggier. Get ready for foggier summers too. Climate change makes San Francisco less foggy. Climate San Francisco thins by a third. It just doesn't matter. Whatever they want to be able to say, it's not about the science. It's about lobbying for a political position and crushing any dissent and sounding certain in order to achieve legislative goals. Climate change causes more hurricanes. Climate change causes less hurricanes. Obesity causes climate change, but climate change also causes starvation. Climate change will both increase and decrease fertility. Here they're just basically giving up. I think fertility increases, it's climate change, but decreases, it's climate change. Why not? Climate change winters of the future will be colder and also warmer. Why not just predict both, which is what they do? More snow, less snow, more cold. Beavers are good for the climate. Beavers are bad for the climate. Which is it? It get, makes you so upset that it may as well. I, I think this one's probably true. Is when you start reading all this stuff, you're going to get an upset stomach. This could easily happen. Climate change will give people more diarrhea. Why not? AOC's chief of staff said in the Green New Deal in two, July 2019. This is one of the architects. The interesting thing about the Green New Deal is it wasn't originally a climate thing. Did you guys think of it as a climate thing? Because we really think of it as how do you change the entire economy thing? And that's what you have to understand. The science is literally used as a lobbying tool for legislation. And when the legislative goals change, the science changes. And I'm gonna bring up COVID again. Why is New York and New Jersey all dropping masks and all these other states? Because the science hasn't changed. They're actually much higher with you know, COVID cases and all that hospitalization. What changed was the politics. They know their base wants to return to normal. So suddenly the science has changed. The political science has changed. Defending, defunding police is now a climate solution. This is good climate policy. There's no Green New Deal without police abolition. This was during, after the George Floyd riots and, uh, and uh, protests. NASA scientists came out and said this, Kate Marvel, climate change linked to white supremacy will never head off a climate catastrophe without dismantling white supremacy. Calls for climate and racial justice. This is now climate science, white supremacy, the cosmic. The former head of NASA was James Hansen. He was arrested half a dozen times protesting climate change, and he endorsed a book suggesting ridding the world of, of industrial civilization and raising cities to turn off the greenhouse gas machine. That was NASA's lead global warming scientist, the dispassionate scientist. UN climate chief Christina Figueres laments democracy is very detrimental in global warming. She lauded the one party rule in China for doing it right on climate. China is able to implement policies because its political system avoids legislative hurdles. Now, not only that, but New York Times, Obama's energy secretary, what COVID lockdowns have given the, the West is a Chinese style government because now you have governors under executive power of a, of a COVID emergency, viral emergency, can now essentially with public health bureaucrats put lockdowns, stay at home orders. They were able to do all of this in the last two years without a vote of legislator, without democracy. We became more like China at the once free West. We gave up our energy dominance in 2020, or beginning of 2021, we had uh, the most energy dominance since Harry Truman was president in 1952. Uh, we had energy production exceeded consumption for the first time and energy exports exceeded energy imports, all while leading the world in reducing our carbon dioxide emissions. As you rightfully point out, it doesn't affect the global, the global emissions are still, still up there, but our emissions, we led the world. We led everyone who's still in the UN Paris Agreement at the time, and we were shamed for not being in the Paris Agreement. The real results of this kind of lobbying science era constantly Electricity at home is ending UK power. Chief families have to use the power only when it's available. This was just, this, this is like two weeks ago. Britain's facing biggest drop in living standards as energy bills rising. This is all due to Europe, which I have a whole chapter in my book. They're much further along with their version of the Green New Deal and shutting down energy. Essentially, in 1908, fossil fuels accounted for 85% of US energy. In 2015, it was essentially about 80%. Not much has changed in 100 years. What the Green New Deal believes is we can get that 80 plus percent somehow and start whittling it down with solar and wind mandates and, and transform us uh, you know, in a matter of simply decades or less, depending on which you know, person is talking and claiming, but it just doesn't quite work that way. I call these unreliables. I'm not gonna get too much into solar and wind. We can do questions on it, but they're less than 4% of global energy production or US energy production, not because it's combined. And 
I'm not against solar, wind, electric cars. I'm against mandating them and banning other forms of energy in order to promote them. So I think you should have no, no, should be no banning of fossil fuels and mandating of this because that's government picking in an area where they have no business picking. Keystone pipeline versus lithium mine for hybrid cars. We're relying more on China for the rare earth mining for batteries and solar panels. I believe Paul's going to be talking about that. This is the little eco ride plugging in and. You know, if you plug in your electric car these days, it's either going to be coming from a combination of coal, fracking, nuclear. It's not going to be, it, it makes no sense when people think their electric car right now is clean. Not only that's how they power it, but also how it's made with all of the rare earth mining. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more complicated story than you can pull. Russia says it looks like the West will have to rely more on what it calls hostile regimes for its energy supply. This is what's happening is with our Green New Deal style energy policy, we're shutting down American domestic energy, which again, we were 1950s high in terms of dominance. And we're now making, uh, we have the, currently now this last year, the Biden administration is begging OPEC to increase production. We're, uh, uh, Russian oil imports are at a near a 12 year high. And we're now much more reliant on China for solar panels, which some estimates are 90% of our solar panels come from China and also the rare earth mining for all of the wind turbines and electric car batteries. China, meanwhile, has been going ahead, full surge coal stuff, pilot, uh, coal powered uh, plants. And I think it's like about average of one a week, they're just expanding. Regardless of what you think about climate, the solutions that they've come up with, whether it's carbon taxes, cap and trade, Green New Deal, UN climate agreements, none of the strategies that have been offered by the US government or by the EPA or anyone else has the remotest chance of altering the climate if in fact it is actually controlled by carbon dioxide. That was Dr. Robert Giegengack, University of Pennsylvania, I interviewed him for my book and film. The US Green New Deal, no impact, no effect. Even using UN science, the Green New Deal's temperature impact would be barely distinguishable from zero. Climate bans have been proposed on anything from plastic straws, fracking, light bulbs, drilling meat. And this is where it gets really interesting because the climate lockdown. Uh, people say, oh, that's just a, you know, conservatives made that up. No, this is actually a phrase from a Bill Gates, George Soros funded professor in Europe who came up with, you know, who used the phrase. I like this. You guys might be offended, but this is literally what's happened. That's the next variant. I think it's the Soviet variant coming out, but I think it's all over now because we're in a midterm election. At least it's over for now. I think it's all going to start loosening. I just came from Boston. They had a vaccine mandate. I think they're even going to drop that within a month. Shutting down the whole economy is the only way of limiting global warming to two degrees C. This was Eva DeBoer, former head of UN climate. He said that in 2015, or I think he said 2013. I said the date up there, but he was referring to two years ahead. But it's an interesting thing to say because that's essentially what the lockdowns did, at least briefly for a few months. And it still, it did reduce CO2 emissions, but it wasn't uh, that much. But here's what a paper, UK Guardian, big climate activist paper, Global lockdown every two years needed to meet the UN Paris Climate Agreement. You're getting an idea of where climate activists want to take the world. This is the professor, Mariana Lazucato, University College. In the near future, the world may need to resort to lockdowns again, this time to tackle a climate emergency. Under a climate lockdown, governments would limit powered vehicles, ban consumption of red meat, impose energy saving measures, while fossil fuel companies would have to stop drilling. We must overhaul our structures and do capitalism differently. That's the only way we can avoid it. Washington Post, we'll flatten the corona curve. We can flatten the climate curve. Imagine two weeks to flatten climate. Give up your car, your heat, give up all energy. Just two weeks, that's all we need. Chuck Schumer urging Joe Biden to declare a national climate emergency. Think about that. The viral emergency gave executives huge powers without legislative. They were able to do everything from ban backyard barbecues, weddings, funerals, stay at home orders, curfews. That's the kind of power that the climate activists have been lusting after, and they were frustrated and angry when it happened for COVID. Klaus Schwab, founder of the Davos Economic World Forum, the world must act jointly to revamp all aspects of society's um, work. We need a great reset of capitalism. So a lot of the climate activists and the progressives and the billionaire class have all been seizing on COVID and climate. Time Magazine, the pandemic remade every corner. Now it's climate's turn. Marxism's new face. This was in 2021. Climate lockdown study. Americans need to cut energy use 90%, live in 600 square feet, fly once every three years, limit new clothing, eat a plant-based diet, collective transport, universal basic income, and degrowth. This was University of Leeds in a major journal study in the Journal of Global Environmental Change. I want to point out, this is not a Greenpeace blog. I, I have to keep pointing that out. I'm going to go through these 
Should everyone have their own personal carbon quota calls for uh, emission allowances? This is a whole nother movement. This is again, 2021. This is all post COVID. The whole world of climate activists has been open to how successful. So successful that a new credit card's come out, fighting climate change with every swipe. You monitor your personal score. You plant a tree every time you make a purchase. The United Nations and MasterCard have joined forces in 2021. CO2 monitoring your carbon footprint. It cuts it off when you're spending, when you hit your carbon dioxide max. This is a form of economic degrowth uh, or planned recession. World Economic Forum, the Davos billionaire crowd love this. Well, many of us are aware that we needed to reduce our carbon footprint. We can now be keeping a tab of it. It's difficult. This new credit card monitors and cuts off spending. This is their actual proposal. 22, 20, 2021 International Energy Agency, the premier journal on Inter International Energy Agency, once again, not a Sierra Club blog, called for behavioral changes to fight climate change, a shift away from private car use, upward speed limits, thermostat controls, limits on hot water. And that's, those are exact quotes. That's actual, that's actual screenshot from the report. UK funded report right before COVID started, absolute zero. Stop flying, no new roads, airport closures, stop eating beef, lamb, stop doing anything that causes emissions. Regulate CO2 similar to asbestos. We exhale CO2, we inhale oxygen, we exhale CO2. They want to regulate what we humans exhale similar to asbestos. This was right before the lockdown. Once again, UK funded government report, um, major report delivered to the prime minister, debated. These are not obscure, oh, this is some blog he's trying to make it. To, no. Journal Nature, the premier scientific journal. COVID lockdowns are key to begin personal carbon allowances, restrictions on individuals that were unthinkable only one year before pre-COVID lockdown, have us more prepared to accept tracking and limitations to achieve a safer climate. Do you see what's happened here with COVID and climate? British Medical Journal study, again, premier British Medical Journal, not some obscure you know, activist or someone on YouTube, British Medical Journal, Price hikes to fight climate change, meat consumption cut almost 80%, substantially fewer journeys by car. That's not enough. Uh, 230 medical journals joined together to say climate was the greatest threat, declared the COVID-19 response a template for a climate response. Remember, the COVID-19 response was the greatest advance of, res of restricting human liberty, freedom, and under oppressive lockdowns that had massive psychological drug addiction, depression, impacts on kids, economic, this is what 230 medical journals think is a great template in their actual report. Paper published in the prestigious journal laments democracy calls for authoritarian environmentalism. This was actually just in November of, of last year. Um, political legitimacy, authoritarianism. This is again, a major, uh, the, one of the premier political science journals. Lund University in Europe, the halt climate change, we need an economic, ecological Leninism. And now not John Lennon, the Beatles, but Vladimir Lenin. State power should be defined, to be, should be used to ban SUVs, private jets. Anthony Fauci in September of 2020, COVID-19 due to extreme backlashes from nature will require changes in human behavior, other radical changes, rebuilding the human, the infrastructure of human existence. Anthony Fauci has had his foot in the environmental climate movement couldn't wait to get this out. This was all during the heady days. They just thought, we are now in power. Let's keep piling on. This is great. Is there a tax you can pay to stop climate change? Does it only work uh, to stop COVID? Does that only work for climate? I mean, that's the thing. They've always implied if we just pay more taxes, the carbon tax will have it, we'll get a better climate. It doesn't work though. People must make a declaration why they need to travel. You, and that's under a COVID lockdown, under a climate lockdown. You can't fly commercial unless it's morally justifiable. This is a major environmentalist, Eric Holtheis proposed this. People um, had to explain the reasons why you had to leave in Europe, why you could travel. And that's the same thing that they're trying to propose now for the climate. You can't travel unless it's justified. Andrew Yang, Democrat candidate, ran for mayor of New York. He wants to get rid of private car ownership and have roving fleets of rental electric cars instead, major climate activist. Canadian Magazine, it's time to ban the sale of pickup trucks. They want you to, when you need a truck, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and rent one. Owning a car outdated 20th century thinking. This was a UK transport minister. So you see what's going on there. They're going after private car ownership. This is showing up in major government reports. Electric cars won't save us. We need to get rid of cars completely. This is business insider. Houses pose more of a danger to climate than vehicles. So if cars are so bad, my gosh, they're going to try to get rid of individual houses. They want us all living in tiny flats because uh, that's climate friendly. Next up, your kids having a baby, pure environmental vandalism. So you see what's happening here. 
almost finished. <laughs> Doc, this has happened just about a couple months ago. A doctor had diagnosed the first medically diagnosed case of climate change. This is the head of the emergency room department. Again, not some medical student having fun. This is a major hospital in Canada actually giving a patient a diagnosis of climate change. Uh, he actually penned it on the chart, but that's okay because there's also Australian academics who want to add climate change as a cause of death on death certificates. This is how crazy this is becoming. It's a pre existing condition. Cause of death, climate change. Bill Gates warns of a climate death toll. The actual economic death toll from climate change will be much, 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 three much, it's greater than we have with this pandemic of COVID. Climate change makes children vulnerable to infectious diseases. So climate and COVID are morphing. In other words, if you don't take care of climate, we're gonna get more viruses and children will be in danger. So expect with people getting cases of climate change from doctors and it's showing up on death certificates, this is going to be next, a climate death toll running like a COVID death toll on TV. It's very possible. But the reality, 99% drop in climate-related deaths, extreme weather. Because the climate's not getting more extreme, it's either the same or slightly better than it was when CO2 was lower. But also because of wealth, prosperity, technology, infrastructure, we can weather the climate, any climate, the weather, uh, the climate, any weather the climate throws at us because we have infrastructure. Climate change causes 5 million extra, extra deaths per year. That's a headline in WebMD from last year, but look at the details. Global temperatures rose, look at the circle, with most deaths caused by cold exposure. So if you die from cold exposure, that goes up as extra deaths from climate change. And by the way, cold kills many times higher, anywhere from eight to 20 times higher than hot. So people will die of cold weather much more than they will from hot weather. So in conclusion, Keep calm and trust the experts. This is what we've learned from COVID and how the climate people are now co-opting it. The New York Times critical thinking leads to misinformation. My advice to you as you're in college, don't be open-minded. According to the New York Times, don't go down the rabbit hole of critical thinking. It's only gonna lead to problems. You must not do your own research when it comes to science. Why would you do your own research when Anthony Fauci, the CDC, or the United Nations Chief could just tell you all scientists agree on climate, and Anthony Fauci will say the CDC said this, and any scientists who disagree are, don't exist. One of the things that happened at the EPA recently uh, was there's a whole panel of scientists, about 50, that have been purged by the new administration, and they're taken away because they know they wouldn't agree with, uh, with the, the EPA reforms that they want to do. So within a year now, the media will be able to report there's a unanimous agreement among EPA scientists on these new environmental bills. And it's like, wait a minute. That's, of course that's possible because they got rid of, they literally purged any scientists who would have dissented this past year. Questioning authority has become too much of a good thing and it's killing people. You're at a university, back in the 1960s, questioning authority was a good thing, but now it's killing people. You can't do it, you have to accept it. It's time to give up on facts. This is Slate Magazine. At least temporarily in favor of more useful weapon, emotions. So when you have a parent who's upset that their kids had a mask for two years, and they say, well, who are, you're only a parent. You're a parent living in West Kansas. How do you know anything about masks? The CDC has experts. They know better than anyone else. They've studied this for decades. How dare you tell them that you don't want your child to wear masks? They're trying to protect them. This is what it's about. It's about whether you're going to be ruled by experts in an unelected bureaucracy. In the case of climate, you're going to be ruled by the 97% and the other who have been repressed and, and again, deplatformed uh, and scientists tenured, forced out, scientists forced out of the United States. If you want the truth, the problem today in 2022 is the truth violates community standards. That's the problem. You can't deliver the truth. That's what's happening to the truth. Big tech, big media, big corporations, billionaires, and government have all come together to essentially crush and allow only one narrative, the government narrative. And it's all part of a larger agenda. If you don't think that, you, know, you can say you're being paranoid, but that's the person that, that's sort of a good encapsulation of the whole. COVID lockdown mess that we're in. It wasn't science that caused lockdowns and mask mandates. And it wasn't science that lifted them. It was political science. It was focus groups. Read the New York Times. So in conclusion, how should you talk to friends or relatives and believe in the conspiracy theory of climate or lockdowns don't work? You give them a pat on the back and you tell them they were right about everything all along because that's the bottom line. Um, 2021, 2020 were the years conspiracy reality outnumbered conspiracy theories. And what I mean by that is, I'm using the word conspiracy, you know, it's sort of jokingly, but the media labels anyone who challenges a public institution. We had a DHS, Department of Homeland Security, uh, terrorism threat two days ago. 
warning of people challenging the trust in government institutions like CDC, FDA, or you know, the, you know, NASA or something. If you challenge their assumptions, you're being not considered a terrorist threat. My organization's Committee for Reconstruction of Tomorrow, CPAC, and that's actually my first book was a politically incorrect guide to climate change, which does more of the science. The second book is more about policy, the green fraud. And I have a third book coming out about the Davos crowd, the great reset and using COVID as an opportunity. And it includes the whole climate connection as well. So with that, I thank you very much. I think questions will be at the end after Paul speaks. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.